CISA reports a ransomware infestation in a U.S. natural gas compression facility. A new threat actor, possibly linked to China's government, is running an espionage campaign against gambling and betting operations in Southeast Asia. More notes on firmware signatures. Huawei loses one in U.S. federal court. Reality winner hopes for a pardon. And the defense asks for a mistrial in the Vault 7 case. And now a word from our sponsor, ExtraHop, securing modern enterprises with network detection and response. Security teams today want to say yes to cloud adoption, just like they want to support enterprises' IoT and edge computing. But the more complex your architecture, the less you can trust your perimeter to keep threats out. When attackers make it into your environment, you need to be the hunter, not the hunted. ExtraHop helps organizations like Home Depot and Credit Suisse detect threats up to 95% faster with the context they need to act immediately. Visit them at RSA for a full product demo of threat detection and response for cloud, multi-cloud, and hybrid enterprises, or learn more at extrahop.com slash cyber. That's extrahop.com slash cyber. And we thank ExtraHop for sponsoring our show. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by McAfee. Security fueled by insight. Intelligence lets you respond to your environment. Insights empower you to change it. Identify with machine learning. Defend and correct with deep learning. Anticipate with artificial intelligence. McAfee, the device to cloud cybersecurity company. Go to McAfee.com slash insights. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, February 19th, 2020. CISA, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, has responded to and reported a ransomware incident at an unnamed natural gas compression facility in the U.S. While the facility didn't lose control of operations at any time, it did experience a partial loss of visibility into real-time operational data. Plant managers elected to implement a deliberate and controlled shutdown, which cost two days of lost productivity and revenue. The attack was confined to a single facility. It's noteworthy that the attack vector was spear phishing. CISA outlines what happened after the spear phishing email delivered its payload. First, inadequate segmentation between information technology and operational technology networks allowed the attackers to pivot from the IT to the OT side. Assets on both networks were disabled. Second, the attacker used what CISA calls commodity ransomware against Windows assets in both networks. The ransomware affected human-machine interfaces, data historians, and polling servers. Third, the PLCs, the programmable logic controllers used to monitor and control physical processes, were left unaffected. And finally, the facility was able to recover by installing replacement equipment and loading last known good configurations. CISA draws several lessons from the incident for other infrastructure operators. They're too numerous to recount here, but in sum, most of them come down to improved planning, more effective and realistic training, better authentication, and more network segmentation. ZDNet suggests the possibility that the malware involved was ECANS, but CISA is silent on this point, and so the suggestion that the ransomware could have been ECANS remains at best speculation. Dragos, which ZDNet properly cites as the source of research into ECANS, itself reached out late this morning to say that ECANS wasn't a likely suspect. Instead, Dragos thinks with high confidence that the incident CISA responded to was the same Ryuk infestation the U.S. Coast Guard reported this past December. They described the infection as well-known ransomware behavior and is not an ICS-specific or ICS-targeted event. Dragos thinks the attack doesn't show even the limited process targeting observed in ECANS and some megacortex incidents. Security firm Trend Micro has found what it considers a hitherto unidentified threat actor— They call it DRB Control, working against gambling and betting operations in Southeast Asia. DRB Control's techniques aren't entirely unfamiliar, however, as Trend Micro discerns some connections with the Winti and Emissary Panda APTs, both of which have been associated with the Chinese government. 
The emissary panda link is particularly interesting. DRB control uses the hyperbro backdoor, which until now had been observed only in emissary panda operations. Trend Micro considers the campaign an espionage effort. When I was growing up, I remember my father telling me, Son, you never want to end up with a car that came through the assembly line late on a Friday afternoon. All those workers are more concerned with starting their weekend than building a quality car. I don't know what evidence there is to support that claim, but the notion that the quality of a product could be affected by the mindset of the people making it is a compelling one. Anita D'Amico is CEO at CodeDX, a firm that aims to address the need to discover and manage vulnerabilities in software applications. She's also part of a team of researchers looking into the question of whether several human factors, developer, team, and environmental characteristics, influence whether developers will inadvertently introduce security weaknesses into their code. I have been interested in human factors for quite some time. I am an experimental psychologist by education, and I work in the area of application security. So I was very interested in the human factors that affect secure code development. I recently was the principal investigator of a research project funded by DARPA to study what are the characteristics of software developers, of development teams, and what are the work conditions that affect secure code development. Well, I mean, let's explore that some. That's fascinating to me because I think it's so easy, uh, particularly when it comes to all this technology, to think uh, sort of in, in the cold terms of ones and zeros and so on and so forth. But what you're looking into here is the fact that those real-world, everyday human factors that we deal with can actually find their way into the security of code. Absolutely. Software is written by people, and people perform differently depending on the circumstances. So if human factors affect how well a pilot pilots an airplane, if it affects truck drivers, if it affects medical doctors, why wouldn't human factors affect how well a software developer develops code? And I was specifically interested in the human factors that affect both code quality and security. And there's been very little research done in this area. So the first thing we did was we did a literature review. And so we developed a way of mining open source repositories for indirect measures of human factors. For example, we looked at the time of day that code was committed to find out if it had an effect on code quality or code security. One of the things that I'll be talking about at the RSA presentation is the results of that study. I'll give you a little bit of insight (laughs) that uh, code is buggier when it's committed between midnight and 7 a.m. I have a, a couple of specific suggestions for anybody who is uh, managing a software development team. And these suggestions are based on scientific evidence. So the first is uh, stop coding after about 11 hours of work. Really take a break uh, and probably put it down until tomorrow. (laughs) Any code that is developed between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning should be carefully reviewed. I would also suggest that you keep developers focused on just a few files. Don't spread them across many different ones, because the more you spread a developer across a lot of different files, the more likely they are to accidentally insert quality or security issues. That's Anita D'Amico from CodeDX. She'll be presenting on this topic next week at the RSA conference in San Francisco. Eclipsium, the security firm that yesterday reported widespread issues with unsigned firmware in peripherals, recommends that signatures be verified every time the firmware is loaded into memory and not just upon initial installation. The researchers note that Apple products routinely do this, whereas Windows and Linux systems do not. But they also argue that verification is better treated as the device manufacturer's responsibility and not something to be left up to the operating system. The trade press has been hard on the industry on this one. Wired takes a glum view that supply chain firmware has been only laxly secured for years and that this is generally known, 
but that there's been little progress made toward fixing it. ZDNet thinks the research shows that companies have failed to learn the lessons they ought to have taken from the Equation Group revelations of a few years ago, and it imputes a mix of discreditable attitudes to device makers. They say, The reason why device manufacturers aren't doing this, that is, verifying signatures whenever firmware is loaded, is because of laziness, indifference, or because they don't feel they or their customers are under any threat. End quote. There's some news from the legal world today. The U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas has tossed out Huawei's suit against a congressional restriction of the company's products and federal programs, Reuters reports. The National Defense Act, the court found, is not an unconstitutional bill of attainder after all, and Congress was acting within its proper authority when it moved to exclude Huawei and ZTE from federal contracts. And finally, attorneys for Joshua Schult have asked for a mistrial on grounds of a Brady violation, claiming that the prosecution failed to disclose potentially exculpatory evidence. Mr. Schult is the former CIA employee accused of having leaked classified information about Langley's hacking tools to WikiLeaks in what became known as Vault 7. The evidence and the filing are classified, but there have been reports in CyberScoop and elsewhere of some of the testimony in the case, and the picture that testimony paints of the CIA's day-to-day workplace life is one of pranks, joshing insults, rearranging desks, shooting one another with Nerf guns, and so on. It's unlikely that this has anything to do with a Brady rule violation, of course, but it does suggest that working at Langley has more in common with an Ivy League frat house circa 1950 than one would have suspected. And now, a word from our sponsor, LastPass. LastPass is an award-winning security solution that helps millions of individuals and over 61,000 organizations navigate their online lives easily and securely. Businesses can maximize productivity while still maintaining effortless, strong security with LastPass. Each entry point in your organization can compromise your business's security. LastPass Identity can minimize risk and give your IT team a breakthrough integrated single sign-on, password management, and multi-factor authentication. LastPass Identity enables you to manage and control user access for all access points in your organization, add an additional layer of security to every single login through multi-factor authentication securely authenticate into your work using biometrics like fingerprint or face. Deliver a passwordless login experience for employees while securing every password in use through enterprise password management. And gain an integrated view across all access and authentication tasks to know which employees are accessing what, when, and where. To learn more, go to lastpass.com enterprise. That's lastpass.com enterprise. And we thank LastPass for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Caleb Barlow. He's the CEO at Synergistec. Uh, Caleb, it's always great to have you back. Um, you've got some uh, some interesting uh, uh, information you want to share today about uh, some ways to uh, go online and gather up some information here. What do you have for us? Okay, so it's the early part of the year. It's time for resolutions and all that good stuff. Maybe this year you ought to change the name of your home Wi-Fi router, Dave. Mm. Because I don't know, is is the name of your home Wi-Fi router got your actual name in it? Like a lot of people name things like Davis (laughs) or Wilson Ned or Jones Family Uh Wi-Fi. Abraham Linksys. Yeah. Yeah. Not a good idea. (laughs) And let me tell you why. So for years, the cars that drive around in map streets aren't only gathering GPS mapping information and taking pictures of the streets. They're also mapping out the location of every cell phone tower and every Wi-Fi hotspot they pass and its exact location. And Hmm. in some cases early on, they were even employing taxi drivers to put antennas on the taxis and map it out. And Hmm. triangulating the available Wi-Fi signals is really important because it turns out it's an even more accurate way of determining location than even GPS or GLONASS because GPS and GLONASS don't work well when you're inside of a building. But knowing what Wi-Fi hotspots are immediately available and their signal strength can tell you exactly where you are. Hmm. So think of it this way, Dave. 
This technology isn't just used for your own phone, but let's say a retailer, let's say, you know, you're inside of a, a large retailer like a Target and somebody wants to know, you know, are you in front of, you know, the women's section or are you in the Starbucks? Literally, right. this location technology is that accurate to be able to tell you where you are inside of a building based on the Wi-Fi signals. Now, okay. to put this in the full perspective of creepy— <laughs> um, one of the providers of this type of data was able to leverage location information of the attendees of the Super Bowl, correlate that with census and other data to determine where attendees came from, their average income, age, and education level. Now, how, how does this happen? Well, remember, hmm. when your phone is looking for a Wi-Fi signal, it isn't just listening for what's available. It's broadcasting out what it wants to see. So, Let's just say your home Wi-Fi network, I don't know if it is, is Bitnernet, right? Yeah, right. Your phone is constantly going, Bitnernet, are you out there? Hilton Honors, are you out there? American Airlines, are you out there? It's constantly broadcasting looking for these signals. Well, I can actually be near you with something like a pineapple and actually see what you're looking for. So I say, okay, he stays at Hilton, he travels on American Airlines. What's this Bitnernet thing? I bet you that's his home address or his home Wi-Fi signal. Well, I can then go look it up in an open source database and find out exactly where you live. Because with this new technology, and you know the largest purveyor of this is certainly Google, but this open source project called Wireless Geographic Logging Engine, or Wiggle, will allow pretty much anyone to put in a unique SSID and find out where in the world that SSID is broadcasting. So if you're the only person in the world with an SSID called Bitnernet, I can find out exactly where you live within a foot or two. Now, if your SSID is something not unique, like let's say Jackie was the name, good luck, because there's going to be thousands of those that pop up all over the place. Sure. But huh. this becomes really problematic for people that want to keep their travel and the locations that they frequent, not just their home, but the locations they frequent private. So Dave, you know, you can think of a whole variety of ways in which this could be used nefariously. Give me some examples. Okay, so let's say we're talking about law enforcement, private investigator, maybe this is a divorce situation. I can probably figure out where your girlfriend lives just off of what your phone is broadcasting if you've ever connected to her, her Wi-Fi network. I can figure out, you know, where she lives and probably also who it is. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> now there is a, there is a way there is a way to hopefully protect yourself on this. So let's, uh, okay. Let's talk Bring it about home, the Caleb. good side. Bring okay, it so home. The, so the first thing is go out to Wiggle and have some fun and play with it. It's pretty interesting what you can find out there. Yeah, it's Wiggle.net. There's one G in Wiggle. That's right. Now. All right. Okay, first of all, and I don't know how well this works, but one of the things some of the providers, mapping companies like Google do is if you append your SSID with underscore no map, they won't map it. So, huh. you know, if it's, you know, Bitnernet, change it to Bitnernet underscore no map. Now, I don't know if they all respect that, but hopefully they do. The second thing to do is clean out all the old SSIDs on your phone and your laptop that you're constantly broadcasting, right? Reduce it down to the ones you actually use. I mean, if you haven't gone in there in a year or so, you probably have hundreds of SSIDs you're broadcasting. You might as well be broadcasting your whole travel history out uh, everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is rename your home network. Use something that's not your name and use something that's not unique. So my strategy with this, and I'd be curious of feedback from people on how well they think this is going to work, but I'm going to name my home network after a car. Because all these cars now have, you know, like, you'll see like Audi Wi-Fi or Jane's Audi Wi-Fi driving around. I'm going to name my home network after a car. Because mm. I think that's not only is it not unique, but cars pop up all over the place when you're doing uh, Wi-Fi mapping. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, something to play with and also be, uh, lose sleep over. So thanks for both of those, Caleb. Always <laughs> great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily news briefing at thecyberwire.com. 
And don't forget you can get the Daily Briefing as an Alexa Flash Briefing, too. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, a Proofpoint company and the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at Observit.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Ivan, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. See you back here tomorrow. Tomorrow.